Hi everyone, let's get started with our next chapter of therapeutic techniques, which is behavior therapy. So I've started off with this silly cartoon here. Watch what I can make Pavlov do. As soon as I drool, he'll smile and write in his little book. So the idea that Pavlov isn't training the dog, the dog is training Pavlov. Okay, so we'll start off here uh, a little bit of a definition of behavior therapy. But before we do, I want you to think about a habit or a behavior that you have ever tried to stop doing and how you did it. So take a minute and just think about that. Maybe you tried to give up chewing on your pencils or maybe you tried to give up smoking or drinking soda or changing your eating habits or something like that and were your habits successful or were your attempts to change successful yes or no so think about why they were or why they would not um, so let's move on and talk a little bit about how behavior therapy can help you with these situations. First of all, you need to know that behavior therapies involve a variety of specific techniques which use learning principles to deal with maladaptive behavior. So we're, we're talking about changing behavior only. So when I say behavioral principles, what I'm talking about is operant conditioning and classical conditioning. All those behavior principles that you certainly learned in intro psych and then we talked some about uh, at the beginning of the semester. And behavior can be either overt or covert. So overt behavior is behavior that you can see. So if you're laughing and jumping around, that's overt behavior. But the feelings that you have about that, we can't necessarily see. So feelings and thoughts are considered covert behavior. But for behavior therapy, these kinds of counseling techniques can work to change both the behavior we can see and then the underlying behavior. Uh, let me talk a little bit about just the development of behavior therapy. We can trace it back to the 1950s. Of course, you've all heard of B.F. Skinner, and he wrote a book called Science and Human Behavior. And uh, I don't have the second one listed here, but he, um, in that book, he talked about how we can use principles of operant conditioning to change behavior, specifically positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. And then a man named Joseph Volpe in the late 50s wrote a book called Psychotherapy by Reciprocal Inhibition, which is really systematic desensitization. And we will talk about that here in just a couple of minutes. So these two made the therapeutic community lean toward looking at behaviorism and away from Freudian techniques which were still very popular in the 1950s. Now, when it comes to behavior therapy, I'm going to describe some techniques in a moment, but I want to tell you a little bit about some of the things that we assume about humans and about human nature. So the first assumption that we can make is that this therapy is going to focus on the maladaptive behavior itself rather than the underlying cause. Um, so if a person is afraid of public speaking, let's say, we're going to work on changing that fear. We're not going to work on the things their mother did to them or the reasons why they develop that fear of public speaking. So it's just working on the fear. But the problem with this is that sometimes you have an issue with something called symptom substitution. And this occurs when you don't tackle the underlying problem. Sometimes if you eliminate one symptom, another one comes up. For example, phobias. You know, phobias, fears, unless you really tackle what's going on, you might eliminate one fear, but then another one is going to pop up in its place. So that symptom substitution is something you have to be careful about with behavior therapy. A second assumption is that all maladaptive behaviors can be unlearned. So what we're assuming here is that if you learn something that's maladaptive, like fear or anxiety, then you're also able to unlearn it using classical or operant conditioning. A third assumption is that learning principles are effective in modifying behavior. So again, we can use uh, different techniques based on classical or operant conditioning to help you unlearn behaviors. Behavior therapy focuses on the here and now. That's what the BT stands for. Focuses on the here and now with little concern for past events. So again, we're not too concerned about what caused your problem. We're just concerned with fixing it now or taking care of it now. And some people criticize this saying, well, isn't that just kind of like a, applying a Band-Aid? Um, there may be, and there may be some truth to that. So we'll talk about that. 
And then finally, the behavior therapist is creative in adapting behavior to fit the client. So let's take this picture of the this um, person with a pet. So we know that people in nursing homes often have to deal with depression and loneliness. And so behavior therapy can be very helpful. Uh, lots of nursing homes will bring in pets and do pet therapy, but if you've got a person who doesn't like pets, then you may have to settle for a plant or something else. So there just needs to be that creativity in adapting it to the person. If you are um, at heart a psychoanalyst, but you're using some behavioral techniques, then maybe you want to use a little bit of dream analysis. That's an example. All right, now as far as the counseling process goes for um, behavior counseling, the thinking is that counseling is a learning experience, not so different than what you would have in school. And there are steps that are involved that are really very similar to the counseling process, just with learning involved. So for example, the very first step is to establish a trusting relationship. No matter what kind of therapy you're using, that's always gonna be the case. The next thing that's important to do is to really define the problem that you're experiencing. And let's take as an example, somebody who's afraid of social situations who really gets nervous around social situations. So when you define the problem, the first thing you have to look at are the antecedents. What, in, what triggers the problem? So perhaps for this individual, it's having to go to social events. Maybe their job requires going to different kinds of social events. What are the reinforcers that are involved in the problem? So if a person is afraid of social events, when they go to a social event, they're likely to be scared. They're likely to feel as though they seem awkward. They are unsure of what to say to people. They, you know, they don't want to talk to people. And the reinforcers you get from that are not so good. People may not want to talk to you. They may leave you alone, things of that nature. And then what are the consequences? Well, the consequences are you leave feeling awkward and you leave feeling um, like you just don't know how to do this and people aren't interested and they don't like you. So when you define the problem, you have to look at all three of these things. And then you determine techniques that go along with that. And we'll be talking about those techniques here in a moment. So what kind of behavioral techniques can deal with the situation as you've laid it out. So the first behavioral technique we'll talk about, and you should have at least had a little bit of inkling of all of these in intro psych, is systematic desensitization. Uh, systematic des desensitization grows out of classical conditioning and it's used largely for phobias. And this assumes that phobias are a conditioned response to something that's neutral. So if you're afraid of water, you know, there's nothing scary inherently about water. You have learned to be afraid of water because you associate something scary with it. So maybe drowning or maybe sharks, those, are the, those kinds of things would be scary that you associate with it. And the basic idea behind systematic desensitization is a technique called reciprocal inhibition that I mentioned just a little bit ago. This is when the idea that you can stop one response with another response. For example, here we're inhibiting, we're stopping the anxiety with relaxation. You physiologically cannot be relaxed and anxious at the same time. It, those are incompatible physiological responses. So what we're doing with systematic des desensitization is teaching you to combat your anxiety with relaxation. So let's talk about the major steps here involved in systematic desensitization. The first thing that we do is teach clients progressive relaxation. Now, most people think that they know how to relax, but they actually don't know how to relax. And progressive relaxation is a type of relaxation that teaches you to, to contract and then relax each muscle in your body separately until you learn to do it all together. So let's, let's just try the first step here together. What I want you to do is just get comfortable wherever you are, sitting in your chair or lying down or whatever, and get as relaxed as you think you can be. Now, in actuality, if we did put sensors on you, we would show that you still had quite a bit of muscle tightness, but try and relax. Now I want you to take your hands, your fists, and clench them as hard as you can. Just clench, make fists, tight, tight, just clench, clench. Okay, and then relax. Just relax a minute, relax those muscles, and then do it again. Clench your fists really tight, and then relax. Okay, so we've just done one small part of your body, and what we would do over a period of weeks teaching this takes weeks, this isn't a session or two, is that we would work 
every part of your body separately until we got to the point where I could say to my client, okay, I want you to relax and they're able to do it. So that's why it's called progressive. So that's the first thing you do is teach the client how to do that. So after a few weeks of that, the second step is that you make a hierarchy of anxiety producing items. So think about whatever it is the client's afraid of, and then you make a hierarchy going from the least thing the person would be afraid of regarding that fear to the most fearful thing. So let's take a spider phobia. Now I want to warn you on the next page there is a uh, there are a couple of pictures of real spiders. So if you don't wish to look at that, you can just skip on through. Okay, so here would be our example hierarchy. In the real hierarchy, you would have about 30 steps actually. I've just listed four of them skipping steps in between. So let's say for the person, the least fearful thing about their spider fear is that they can look at a picture of a spider from a distance and not be afraid. Okay, and then you've got a few other steps. Maybe they look at a picture closer and then maybe some steps up, they could watch a movie of a spider. That's scarier to them. What's even more scarier would be seeing a spider for real and holding and touching the spider would be the 30th step, the absolute last step. I have it as number four there because I've skipped a bunch of steps in between. So you make the hierarchy, you construct that hierarchy. And then you can you engage in, in a conditioning process where you start out helping the client relax. So you get them to relax, they're relaxed. And then you show them that whatever that first step is, show them the picture of the spider. And if they're relaxed, you move on to the next stage. And maybe that's holding a picture of a spider. If they become anxious doing that, you take that away and you drop back to the previous stage where they're looking at a spider from a distance. So you keep moving up the hierarchy like that and the person is relaxed, but if at any time they feel anxious, you drop back to the previous stage and you stay there until the person can handle it while being relaxed. So it is a slow moving process for people, but it absolutely works if people are willing to do it. And that's the thing, you know, this is a process that's going to take months. And depending on the person's insurance, they may not pay for it. The insurance may not be willing to pay for it. And part of the reason why is it's not considered medically necessary. And a lot of people who have fears and phobias don't encounter them enough in their everyday life to actually seek therapy for this. For example, I'm really afraid of snakes, but I rarely uh, encounter them in my everyday life, so I've never thought to seek therapy for it. But say if you're an executive, a business executive, and you have to travel and you're afraid of flying or closed in spaces, this is probably going to benefit you to go through this. So you absolutely, um, it works. And I don't think I mentioned this at the beginning, but uh, behavioral therapy is not something that your average run-of-the-mill therapist is trained in. This is a specialty kind of therapy, and if anybody's going to go through this, they really need to find a specialist in behavior therapy. I'm not trained to do this. I'm, I know what it is, but I'm not trained to do this. That's a whole specialization. Here is a video that I will put in the description section of this video that you can take a look at. It is not for everybody. It's a treatment of arachnophobia using virtual systematic desensitization, progressing to real systematic desensitization. So it has some pictures of virtual spiders, but at the very end, it also has uh, some big spiders in it. So if you don't want to watch that, that is totally optional. Okay, a second kind of behavioral therapy, if you don't want to mess around with this long term, you know, taking weeks and months stuff, then you may decide to try implosion therapy or flooding. And this is a type of therapy where we give a person intense exposure to their fear kind of all at once. And the reason that this works is because we are only physiologically able to stay afraid for a short period of time. So if I encounter a snake, which I'm afraid of, I will have the sympathetic nervous system response, which we all know is when your heart races and you sweat and you feel sick and sometimes people faint. But after about half an hour or so, your parasympathetic nervous system kicks in to slow all that down and you start to feel a little bit better. So if we take a person and expose them to whatever it is they're afraid of, whether it's snakes or heights or what have you, and they're very scared, it's really hard at first, but then they will start to calm down and see that nothing, you know, nothing really bad is going to happen to them. So it's an intense type of therapy. Um, 
there's a video, I'm connecting a video, I'll put this in the comment section too, on a type of implosion therapy that has to deal with a woman's kind of fear of closed in spaces. And they, the therapist helps her by like putting a pillowcase on her head. And I mean, she puts it on. It's, it's, it's nothing bothersome in my mind to watch. It's not like a spider video. So you can take a look at that to see. Again, you have to be a specialist to administer this kind of therapy. Uh, and you also wouldn't do it in certain settings. If someone's afraid of water, you're not just going to throw them in a pool or a body of water and hope everything goes well. That's, it just doesn't work that way. So uh, you have to really be trained to know what you're doing. So on the, this next page, I put a picture. This is the... Um, this is in uh, Dubai, is it Dubai or Abu Dhabi? It's in, it's in the United Arab Emirates. I can't think what city it's in, but it's the world's tallest building. Look at the skyscrapers around it. It dwarfs it. And uh, if you've just got a couple minutes for fun, you can go and Google. It's called like the Benai Brith or something like that. People have gone up to the top of like those radio towers you see at the top and filmed themselves, like scanned around. So people have gotten permission to do that. So if you want a, a little, you literally feel like, you know, you're on top of the world. It's just incredible. So if you're crazy, then you would go up there and do your flooding for fear of heights, I suppose. Same with something like snakes. I assume you've all seen the in original Indiana Jones movie. He was afraid of snakes, and he got thrown into the pit of not just snakes, but cobras. And by the end, when he walked out, he uh, didn't have his fear. He never liked them, but he didn't have his fear as much. So those are just kind of crazy examples of implosion. Okay, a third, uh, third method here of behavioral therapy that we use is aversion therapy. This is something that's uh, not used commonly. And again, you really have to be skilled and know what you're doing with this. But with aversive therapy, we use classical conditioning to try and instill a fear or aversion in you. And this is often done to help people stop habits like drinking or smoking, for example. There is, for instance, a drug called antabuse that people can take. It's not used real commonly, but when it's mixed with alcohol, it makes people really, really sick. And so when they drink alcohol, they become violently ill. And what they do is start to associate that illness with the drinking. And then they don't, they have an aversion to the drinking after that. Um, same with things that you know you can do with smoking for instance you can take this picture and if somebody uh, likes to smoke i've seen this done before you just like collect all their butts for a while and then put them in an ashtray sort of thing and then ask them to try and suck on those or smoke those and it just creates this aversion originally averse aversive therapy was used pretty extensively for people with pedophilia but they found just short-term effects on the on that so they're not using it much anymore Okay, now these three things essentially um, are usually done by a therapist, although you can use mild forms of aversion therapy on yourself. If you've ever tried like the rubber band method around your wrist, if you bite your nails, sometimes people will put a rubber band around their wrist and they'll snap it when they're tempted to bite their nails. And so they begin to associate that pain with biting their nails or they get that stuff that you can paint on your fingernails if you tend to bite them and it's really yucky so you associate that yuckiness um, works for the short term not necessarily so much for the long term a therapy that you can do your okay so here i got the definition here a method you pair an undesirable condition stimulus like shock with the unconditioned stimulus and that example comes from uh, the pedophilia so pedophiles would look at pictures of children and when physiological measures indicated arousal they would deliver shock to them so you can read a little bit more about that all right, as I was saying, the last uh, method of therapy we'll talk about here that you can use for yourself is behavioral modification. This is a type of therapy that's done a lot in schools, in group settings, prison kinds of systems. What we're trying to do is change people's behaviors by reinforcing behaviors that are desired and either ignoring or in some cases punishing undesired behaviors. Um, ways that this can be done, there's lots of different ways. Um, you can use, like on this next 
page a chart. This is how many parents train their kids to do charts or to be potty trained. So if you do certain chores a day, you get a star or a sticker. And then at the end of the week, if you get so many, you get a reward. Schools obviously use this. I remember when my son was in preschool, they would get different colored bears at the end of the day. And if, you know, blue bear was good and red bear was bad. And if you got so many blue bears a week, you got uh, a treat. But you can use this for your yourself too. And I was thinking during this time of quarantine, I've heard a lot of students say it's just so hard for them to concentrate and focus on their schoolwork. You can do something like this for yourself. You can set a timer for a half an hour. And if you do your schoolwork for a half an hour, then you get, you know, a 10 minute break or something like that. Or if you do, you know, two sets of hour long studyings, then you get some kind of a reward. So modifying your own behavior through the reward system can be really helpful. Now, a couple of criticisms here of behavior therapy. It's certainly not perfect. One of the biggest ones I've already mentioned is that it doesn't go deep enough and so that you end up with the symptom substitution problem. So if you eliminate one type of anxiety, and, but you don't tackle what it's really all about, you may develop anxiety to something else. So that's always a possibility. It's okay, so you eliminate one behavior, but if the root of the problem is not addressed, you will develop other problem behaviors. I forgot I had all that on there. A second criticism is that people think that it disregards emotions, disregards your emotions. Um, Skinner said that emotions were actually behaviors, but he didn't spend a lot of time talking about that. And he wasn't, he wasn't a psychologist per se. He didn't, he mostly was an experimental psychologist. He didn't see clients. He didn't do counseling. But it's been criticized because we're focused so much on the behavior that you're not talking much about the feeling. And of course, for us, all semester long, that's what we've been dealing with, our feelings. And then the, the criticism, the very rightful criticism, that aversive therapy can be harmful. So we don't use therapies that shock people anymore, but they used to. And of course, sometimes people, as long, if they didn't comply or do what they needed to, they would really uh, be harmed by that. So that's something you have to be careful about. Behavior therapy is very effective for the following. It's very effective for fears, any kind of anxiety, phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. That picture there is a type of therapy for obsessive compulsive disorder called exposure response prevention. And what you do is, for example, this person is afraid of germs and dirt. Um, so they normally wash their hands like 100 times a day. So what you would have this person do is get their hands really dirty, really yucky, really germy, and then prevent them from washing for periods of time. What this does, it's, it's like a type of flooding. It shows them that nothing horrible is going to happen. You can do that for checking behaviors too. Behavior therapy is very good for depression because what we find is for a lot of people who are depressed, they are not getting a lot of positive reinforcement for non-depressed behaviors and they're getting too much reinforcement for depressive behaviors. So that's part of the reason why when people are depressed, in, you know, you ask them how they're they're doing and they're they're sad and of course you feel sympathy and compassion for them. Um, but that's hard for a person to support that. And after a while, they stop calling and coming around and then the person loses a lot of support and it just continues. So behavior therapy teaches people how to behave in ways that they get reinforcement for. And then behavior therapy is also effective for substance abuse, not just through the use of drugs, but also through the use of kind of a symptom substitution. So we try to figure out what a person, when does a person use substances, what kind of reinforcement are they getting from that, and then we try to find other situations for them that can give them a similar or the same reinforcement without the unhealthy behaviors. Okay, we are going to switch out, if I can get this done here, we're going to go ahead and move from cognitive therapy to, or behavioral therapy to cognitive therapy. So I need to pull this back up. Looks like, thank you for your patience. <laughs> I did these as separate slideshows. Okay. 
Um, I have cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy together because cognitive therapy is technically called cognitive behavioral therapy. And they are a set of therapies that are related with some differences. So here's a silly cartoon to get us started. Your problems are caused by all or nothing thinking. It's either that or you don't have any problems. Hmm. Well, all or nothing thinking is one of the hallmarks of the cognitive irrational beliefs that people have. So that's what this therapy is meant to uh, assist with. So the one thing to, uh, to start with about cognitive therapy is that it really holds a healthier view of people. Um, it looks at people as uh, not impulsive, irrational beings. We're not driven by unconscious impulses. Instead, we learn to think irrationally. So that how it all goes along with the behavioral as we grow older. And because we learn to think irrationally, we can learn to think rationally as well. There are really two different kinds of cognitive therapies we'll talk about. The first one is irrational emotive therapy called RET for short, or sometimes it's called REBT, which is rational emotive behavioral therapy. And Albert Ellis is the person who originated that. And you will see him on the Gloria uh, a much younger version of Albert Ellis. Here he is. You'll see him on the Gloria video. And then cognitive therapy, who was created by Aaron Beck. So we will talk about uh, both of these. And we'll start off with Ellis with the rational emotive therapy. He lived from 1913 to 2007. I actually saw both him and uh, Beck at a conference, oh, probably in the early 2000s or so. And they were uh, kind of talking about their individual theories because they have very similar views but just opposing techniques and they were sitting on this stage and it was a huge ballroom filled with hundreds of people I will never forget this I was standing in the back because it was packed everybody wanted to see these two giants of course and they were sitting in these chairs that literally looked like thrones. And Albert Ellis was a little guy. Uh, so he just looked like this tiny person sitting in this huge throne. And they were both quite old at this point. And I think Beck is actually still being. I'll have to check on that. But um, that, was, that was just an interesting part of my career, getting to see them talk. So uh, the way to think about Albert or Ellis's theory is we are what we think. He initially uh, started off in counseling, counseling people with marital difficulties, and he gave really authoritative information, and you will see that very much in the Gloria video. He tells her what to do, which of course is the antithesis of what we've known to be about cognition, but that's really what he, he does. Uh, going a little bit too hard here. Um, he believes that people learn irrational thoughts early in our life, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So he believed that we are what we think. On the next slide, I'm going to show you a question and then think about a few questions answered uh, listed afterwards. So here's the first question. I often worry that I, so think about this one. What are some things that you often worry about? And then think to yourself, okay, if this worry came true, what does it mean and why is it so bothersome to me? What's the worst thing that could possibly happen? How likely is it for that worst thing to happen? And if so, how would you cope with it? And what do you get out of thinking like this? So an example might be if you're worried about doing well in a class. I often worry that I'm not going to do well in a class. OK, if it came true that I wasn't doing well in a class, what does that mean and why is it so bothersome? OK, you might think it's bothersome because I do well in school. I have a good GPA and that would throw my GPA off. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Okay, the worst thing that could possibly happen would be that you wouldn't do well in a class and maybe your GPA went down. How likely is it for that worst thing to happen? Okay, so you've worried about grades and classes before and always done okay, so probably not highly likely. But if it did happen, how would you cope with that? And you might think to yourself, well, I just have to try harder in other classes and, and try to do better next time. 
And then what do we get out of thinking like this? Worry does something for us. Anxiety does something for us. And that's one of the main things that Ellis handled. And largely it's a safety valve because we tend to think if we worry about things, we are anticipating anything that could happen that could harm us. And of course, we're seeing now with the coronavirus that uh, we really can't anticipate lots of things that could happen. But it keeps us safe. It makes us feel protected because we're trying to anticipate any possible thing that could go wrong. So Ellis tries to address, he kind of uses these sorts of questions to address people's problems. So I mentioned that he believes irrational beliefs are learned very early in life. For example, it is horrible to make mistakes. That's an irrational belief. So examples of irrational beliefs, okay, I should never make mistakes. I should always do really well in school. And what you're going to find oftentimes is that our irrational beliefs contains the word should, must, and ought. I should be able to get A's in all my classes and still work. I must or I have to do well on this test. I ought to be able to balance my home life and my school life. So anytime you hear one of these three words, that's a cue that you're having an irrational belief. So I should get A's on every exam is a typical irrational belief. Ellis was a big fan of stopping the shoulds. And he had this famous saying where he said, stop, you need to stop shooting all over yourself which I think is really funny, but yes, no more shoulds. So here's an example of kind of his belief, his assumptions about human nature here. So if we look at cognitive and affective at opposite sides of the spectrum, they're really two different spectrums. But if we look at it this way, where we've got thoughts on one side and emotions on the other, he really, of course, trends toward that cognitive side. And people are potentially rational as well as irrational. He makes that point. And he talks about how rational thoughts develop for us. Um, and they develop, as I mentioned, very early on, because when you're little, you feel good about yourself for the most part, assuming that you have decent parenting. But as you start to get older, later in childhood, and you start hearing things like, oh, you should have got that last goal, or oh, you could have gotten 100 on this test, we start to evaluate ourselves on the basis of what other people say about us and what other people think about us. We learn that we get approval by doing all the things right or doing all the right things. And we essentially learn to evaluate our experience by how do I get approval from others? So we don't evaluate what happens to us and our accomplishments by what we think of it. We evaluate it based on what other people think of it. And we can't keep a balance between how we evaluate ourselves and what other people, and what other people think. So I know I've mentioned this example before, but when I would bring home a test when I was little and would have like a 95 and my mom would say, well, why wasn't it 100? The lesson I got from that is that excellent isn't good enough. Perfection is good enough. And she, she didn't mean anything by it. She was just trying to encourage me. But you definitely get that irrational belief from situations like that. So let's talk a little bit about a little bit more about how some of these things develop. And Ellis came up with this AB, ABC theory of personality that help explains how irrational beliefs develop. So A is some event and C is our emotional response to an event. So the situation that I very commonly use and I like very much is if you're scheduled to do something with a friend and they contact you at the last moment and cancel and don't really give an explanation of that. Well, that gets us upset. We might get depressed about something like that because we had looked forward to it. We don't understand. We feel rejected, that sort of thing. But Ellis says, we tend to think that A causes C. We tend to think we're depressed because our friend rejected us. But Ellis says, it's not the event that causes the response. It's how we think about it. So we assume A causes C. It really does not for Ellis's theory. For Ellis's theory, it's our beliefs, how we think about that event that leads to C. That's really the difference. That's the biggest difference. So our belief patterns. Now here's how this plays out here. So we think A causes C. We think an event causes our negative feelings. Ellis says no, it's our beliefs. 
about that event that causes our feelings. And we have two different kinds of beliefs. We can have irrational beliefs and we can have rational beliefs, two different kinds of events. Uh, so irrational beliefs, let's take the same example. An irrational belief is a belief in a, about an event that you don't have any evidence for. So when your friend cancels on you without much explanation, what kinds of things do you say to yourself? You might say, oh, they don't like me anymore. Or, oh, I did something wrong. I'm, you know, they're, I, I, I made them mad. I did something to upset them. You don't have any evidence for that. You have no idea at all. So if you think that, of course it's going to make you depressed. But if you think something like, oh gosh, something must have come up for them. You know, they, they normally would never do something like that to me. I hope everything's okay. Those are more rational beliefs and they're going to lead to more positive emotions rather than negative emotions. So here is a way to kind of look at this. You don't have to write this down if you get it. So the negative event happens. If you have rational beliefs, it will be lead to healthy negative emotions. Of course, you're going to be disappointed, but you're not going to be devastated because you're not going to think that you did something wrong, which you have no evidence for. But over here, if you have an irrational belief, such as, oh, they don't like me anymore, they got a better offer, that's going to lead to an unhealthy negative emotion, which is when you reject yourself and think you did something wrong. Okay, let me give another example of rational beliefs just to clarify. Um, she must have forgotten about our plans. That would be a rational belief that doesn't involve, you know, hurting yourself or punishing yourself. I hope she's, I hope everything's okay. She never does this. Irrational examples would be, she must not like me anymore, she doesn't want to be friends with me anymore, those kinds of things. Another instance that I was just thinking about, um, well, I'll save this for when I talk about the next part, so I have more examples of this. Okay, so I think you get the idea about what irrational beliefs are and what rational beliefs are. So here are some common irrational beliefs that um, uh, Ellis talks about catastrophizing this is a big one okay so when we catastrophize this is when we think the worst think the worst so uh, an example I think is if you text a friend and they don't text you back and you don't hear from them from a day or so and you start thinking okay what did I do I made them mad they don't like me anymore they don't want to be my friend anymore automatically thinking the worst so catastrophizing is very very common another one my favorite word from Ellis, masturbating. This is when you use must. This is kind of like the shooting all over yourself. Don't masturbate either. He said, don't do that. Masturbating is when you say, I must get A's on everything. I must be able to handle a full-time job and school. I must be the perfect parent. So those are good examples of irrational beliefs. So the bottom line of this is that Ellis says our own interpretation of events results in our emotions, not the events themselves. That's important to think about. The goal of treatment in Ellis's rational emotive therapy is to correct those, uh, those irrational beliefs and connect them to our unhealthy emotions and problems. So that graph that I just showed you, the A leading to C and the B leading to C, I will draw that out for clients all the time and explain to them how it's not this event, it's really the way you're thinking about it that causes uh, problems for you. People really, that really resonates with people. It makes them, it really makes a lot of sense to them. So the counselor exposes the irrational beliefs and teaches the client to think rationally. That's really the goal. We want them to replace their irrational beliefs with rational beliefs. The counselor does this. The counselor is an active directive teacher in rational emotive therapy. They challenge, they confront, they persuade the client, and you absolutely saw this in the Gloria video big time. He really was right there and, and trying to get her to change. The uh, counselor is an active directive teacher. You're not just reflecting statements and helping clients find the solution on their own. You are telling them new ways to think, essentially. Okay, so think of Ellis with Gloria. So here's a few books that Ellis has written, some interesting ones. Um, Overcoming Destructive Feelings, Beliefs, and Behaviors, How to Make Yourself Happy, A Guide to Rational Living. So all these are good examples. And then the one that Gloria references that makes me, just cracks me up, The Intelligent Woman's Guide to Manhunting. And she, by gosh, read that book and wanted to talk to him about it. 
So he, he, in his interview with her, he basically talks about what he instructs in this book. It's, it's actually pretty funny. Okay, so how effective is rational mode of therapy? And the answer is pretty darn effective. It's best for higher functioning clients. Really, people need to be reasoning at the formal level of, of if you think about Piaget's theory, the formal level of reasoning because thoughts are abstract and you have to be able to have some metacognitive ability. You have to recognize your own thoughts and be able to um, uh, help challenge them. So it's really, uh, it's fine for teenagers, but it's not, something you'd use for children because they're just not able to reach that level of rationality. It is excellent for people who have issues with public speaking, assertiveness, self-esteem, um, like I said, some anxiety, some with depression. There's good ways to counter depression. So those are some things that uh, it's very useful for. The other method of cognitive therapy we'll talk about here is called cognitive therapy, not special rational mode of therapy like the other one. This is just cognitive therapy. This was designed by Aaron Beck, who was born in 1921, and I just took a look. He is still alive, so he will be 99 in July, apparently. Uh, he is uh, retired. I think his health is is pretty poor. Uh, I went to a conference a couple years ago and he was supposed to be a speaker but wasn't able to make it for health reasons. But, you know, man's 99, so that's okay. Anyway, he has a theory that's similar to rational emotive therapy. The big difference here is then that rather than the counselor being an active directive teacher, Beck sees the therapy as collaborative. So, that you're a team. The counselor and the client are working together to help the client. It's a collaborative thing. You're not teaching the client to think a different way. You are working together to help them solve this problem. So you seek to uncover dysfunctional cognitions and underlying assumptions which uh, are harmful. And in particular, what you're looking to find together are cognitive distortions. So cognitive distortions are errors in reasoning. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So it's not necessarily like an irrational belief planted in your head. It's a way of deducing and inducing reasoning situations that you come to something faulty. Uh, there's a, a, a little video here I'm going to, to put in the comments or the, the description section of this YouTube video. I'd like for you to watch it for a couple of minutes just to get a sense of Beck since you will see Ellis with Gloria and I want you to get a, a sense of Beck's style too. He's much less uh, in your face than Ellis tends to be. So let's talk about these cognitive distortions here. What, what are these all about? Um, I think that's the best way to talk about it is to just to give you some examples and there are some other examples in your textbook which are good but the first one we'll start off with is called arbitrary inference and this is when it's it's very similar to one of the irrational beliefs but you draw conclusions from a lack of evidence with this one. Um, for example, if I'm teaching a class and I see somebody in the back and they look bored and they're sleeping or they're on their phone, um, I might conclude, oh, I'm, I'm a terrible teacher. I'm a bad teacher because that student looks bored and is tired or sleeping. But I don't have the evidence for that, especially when I see a class full of other students who aren't behaving that way. So you, you kind of jump to conclusions. If you're a friend, um, greets you one day and they're not as friendly as they usually are and you just assume they're mad at you, you assume you've done something, then that would be arbitrary inference. You just don't have the, the evidence. How about magnification and minimization? Have you ever heard the term you're making a mountain out of a molehill? My mom used to say that to me all the time. Well, that's an example of magnification. So when we do this, small bad events are made out to be worse, but then large good events are discounted for you or in your life. An example would be in a class, if, you if you're generally doing really well in the class and have a 10 point quiz and you get like a five or a six and you're just beside yourself and oh, what's this gonna do to my grade and, and what did I do wrong? That's probably magnification. That's small potatoes in, in the midst of a whole class. But large positive events, and so maybe you're focusing on that one and not the A that you just got on a test last week or so. So oftentimes we magnify and we minimize kind of events kind of together. But if you do that, I mean that's again that's an example of a cognitive distortion. 
Dichotomous thinking is one we all use pretty commonly. Uh, this is seeing things as either good or bad, black or white. So if you are trying to eat healthfully and you have an ice cream cone and you haven't had one in a while, but you decide to have an ice cream cone as a treat and you're like, oh, I blew it. I just blew my good eating. I might as well just have junk tomorrow. Um, you know, food is not good or bad. General, I mean, there's some, I suppose, that are really good and bad. But in general, if you think that everything you do is either good or bad, that would be a cognitive distortion because most things are kind of in the middle. Um, same with exams, thinking if I don't get an A on this, I will have blown the class. Well, that's dichotomous thinking. So that happens. Uh, Beck talks a lot about something called automatic thoughts, which are similar to the irrational beliefs that Ellis talks about. But these are beliefs and assumptions that develop very early in life. And really, these are pretty much the same as irrational beliefs. He just calls them something different. They are thoughts that automatically come to mind in certain situations. And here are some examples. I'm not smart enough. So if you get back a grade that's not that great that's your it's, that's your first thought i'm not smart enough that's an automatic thought no one respects me i'm not lovable all those are good examples of automatic thoughts and they are harmful because they lead to negative emotions that's really the, the point of it now how do we deal with this what's the therapy like very different as you will see in the video from Ellis's style. The main style of therapy that Beck uses is called collaborative empiricism. So think about these two words. To collaborate is to do something together. Empiricism is to investigate. So what you're doing is investigating with the client the validity of their thoughts. You help the client test the validity of their beliefs. It's like hypothesis testing. You seek the evidence together for something that they believe. So if your client says, nobody likes me, I don't have any friends, nobody likes me, your question as the counselor might be, okay, how do you know nobody likes you? Give me some evidence. And then the client might say, well, nobody calls me up to do things. And then you just go, I'll show you in a minute, but you just go a little bit further with them to test out that belief. You know, does, do you, um, do people seem glad to see you? There's, there's just a bunch of key questions you can ask, but you're trying to find out the validity of that. Now, what do you do if that's true? If they're a really unlikable person and no one does like them? Well, that's a different kind of therapy, really. That's probably going to merit some confrontation and a change in social skills. And if that's the case, that probably is not an irrational belief. But the thing about it is, if they've grown up thinking no one likes them, it's probably affecting their behavior and their demeanor today. They're probably acting in a way that puts people off and perhaps people really don't like them. So that's a whole other avenue for therapy that you're going to explore. So the, the bottom line is you're using this collaborative uh, empiricism. Techniques that you might use, one of the most powerful ones is called decatastrophizing, which obviously you're going to use if you see uh, people using some uh, dichotomous thinking. And the way to do this is to say, what if? And that question that I asked you at the beginning was that, okay, what if you don't do well on this test? And the client says, oh, then it'll probably throw my grade off for the semester. Okay, what if your grade is not as high as you want it to be? Well, I won't graduate with a certain grade point average. Okay, well, what if you don't graduate with a certain grade point average? What if then? And basically what you're doing is you keep asking that question in different forms so you don't sound monotonous, and you lead the client to a conclusion that shows they could probably tolerate what's going to happen and that the worst will not happen. If they don't do well in a class, it's not going to lead to them not getting a job. It's not going to lead to them being homeless or out on the streets. So that's the power behind decatastrophizing. Another thing that you could do is use Socratic dialogue, and you see that in the Beck video that I give you. These are questions designed to lead the client to a logical conclusion. Now, I'm also going to attach this video, put the link to this one, and this is uh, a counselor who's working at the VA, the Veterans um, Administration, and he's seeing clients, and he's seeing a client who's got some um, PTSD from, I think, Vietnam, and he uses Socratic dialogue. So this is a spiraling down type of question set that allows clients to come to a conclusion that their beliefs are not rational. You will see that. 
And then the last technique I'll talk about here is the reattribution technique when you will help clients examine alternative causes of events. So if you have a client who says, you know, my boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever has just been really distant to me and I think they're losing interest and they're going to break up with me, um, reattribution would ask them, okay, so what else could be going on with that person or in your relationship besides that that would cause them to act that way? So you get them to examine alternative causes and perhaps relabel some behaviors. So that uh, can be very powerful. Okay, so let's talk about what else could be causing your spouse to act so distant towards you. What I just said. All right, so to end here, let me mention that cognitive therapies, the ones we just talked about, and really rational emotive therapy as well, are very good for depression because a lot of depression is attributable to cognitive errors in irrational beliefs, a lot of it. Anxiety eating disorders, and also substance abuse, and in addition to the things I mentioned for rational emotive therapy. So cognitive therapies remain one of the leading therapies for many, many psychological um, issues and problems. It is relatively uh, fast. People, You can do a lot of good in six to eight sessions with a client with cognitive therapy. We're not talking about deep psychoanalysis where people are having a lay on the couch for a couple of years. And the, the bottom line of all of it is that you want to teach clients to be their own cognitive therapist. You want them to leave their office having new skills. And so the next time they find themselves in a situation where they're feeling bad, they can look at their own thoughts understand that they're irrational and know how to to correct them. So cognitive therapy and rational motive therapy are meant to really give clients great tools that they can go and use and not necessarily need a therapist again or maybe not every time. So it's very useful in that regard.